for those of you that don't know me, my name is Rick O'Connor. I'm the executive director of the RISC-V Foundation. And we've been, uh, we've been enjoying quite a bit of uh, growth and acceleration and adoption of RISC-V globally. Uh, usually I, I ask people to, uh, before you decided to come to the conference, had you ever heard of RISC-V? Who, who is uh, hearing of RISC-V for the first time? Anybody in the room? Awesome. Only like five people. That's fantastic. When I first started giving this presentation, 95% uh, of the people in the room would lift their hand up three years ago. So th that's very good progress. Okay, everybody else has heard of RISC-V. Who has downloaded the specs from the site? Okay, about half the people in the room. Of you people who have downloaded the specs, who has actually read them? <laughs> okay, and then who has an active project in their lab or company or basement or in the room. Okay, so about a dozen projects, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, so I'll give a quick introduction of where this came from and why, why do we care? I mean, Madhu made, a, made actually a very good point. We don't really care about the ISA, really, but we do. And I, I'll, I'll talk about why. I'll give you a history of how the foundation's structured, how you can participate, all that good stuff. And I probably won't be going through the NVIDIA and Western Digital use case examples in, in this talk, just to keep us on time. Uh, but the slides are going to be in, in the, available for download uh, after the conference so you can see them and certainly happy to talk during the break uh, with anyone about it. So um, I apologize if you can't understand my Canadian accent. Uh, I'm not a very formal individual, so if there's something that I say that you have no idea what it was or what it meant, please just interrupt me and ask me to repeat it in, in a different English, uh, perhaps. So back in 2010, the team at Berkeley uh, were looking to inject some energy into their curriculum uh, at the university for graduate and undergraduate courses and, and thinking about how they could redesign their courses around different technologies. They've been doing this for years, obviously. If anybody uh, is familiar with the Patterson and Hennessy work, right? Patterson is that Dave Patterson from from Berkeley back in the 80s. So this is not something new to the UC Berkeley computer science team. Um, clear choices were, hey, we could just do something modern like x86 or ARM. Both of those are pretty complex, uh, probably too com complex to deal with in terms of a teaching tool, uh, not to the least of which is any IP issues that, that you know, might be prohibitive. So they started a three-month project in the spring of 2010. They wanted to be ready for the fall semester that started in September. Uh, to just do their own very simple clean slate ISA from the ground up. And that turned into four years later. That three month project culminated in May of 2014 with the production of the first uh, frozen base spec. We'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. Along the way, there were many, many tape outs of test chips and many paper publications. Um, and, you know, generally, as researchers do, they publish papers. If people read the papers, that's good. If they don't, they don't really know, right, in general. Uh, and what they found was a lot of people were reading the stuff, uh, not ju just reading it, but downloading uh, the, some of the material that they put online in terms of some of the design work they had done, playing with their own implementations, to the point where as they changed things from one iteration to the next over the course of that three-month project, they'd get feedback from the community saying, hey, wait a minute, you can't change that. What you did there was really, really good, so don't. And that wasn't just from other academics, it was from industry as well. So they started to realize that this was more than just a project inside the four walls of UC Berkeley, if you will. It was a project that had taken on a life of its own and needed to be governed outside the, um, outside the university. So to that end, we created the, the foundation, a nonprofit, uh, open standards body, if you will, in August of 2015 to govern the RISC-V ISA, just the ISA. I always get people asking me, hey, I want a RISC-V core. There's lots of them out there, but they don't come from the foundation, right? They come from the originators of those cores. So one important part of the, uh, this exercise is you are now all official ambassadors of the RISC-V brand. When someone says RISC-V to you, you gently reach out, tap them on the shoulder and say, no, no, mate, sorry, that's RISC-V as in the fifth generation of risk architecture research, dating back to the early 80s under, as I said earlier, Patterson and Hennessy. Risk three and four were sort of posthumously named because they got off the 
program and called the Project SOAR and SPUR, and those are acronyms that only the Berkeley guys know what they mean, so we'll just leave it at that. So why do we care about instruction sets? I mean, really? Here's a, a bunch of rhetorical questions. Why are the lap this laptop and 99% of laptops and desktop servers based on x86, 64-bit? And why are, is the majority of that volume sold by Intel when it's not even their ISA, right? Intel took us down a different 64-bit path, for those of you that might remember. So this uh, x86-compatible 64-bit ISA actually came from AMD, uh, right? So that's, a, that's just an interesting data point. Why, why are all the mobile devices that we're carrying around ARM-based? Um, why can't Intel sell mobile chips? They have invested a lot of money over the years to try to get into the mobile sector as have many ARM partners invested a lot of money to try to make a dent in the server space. And there's progress, but uh, you know, the majority of the volume is x86 based. And how does IBM still sell mainframes? Fundamentally, the reason is the ISA is the most important interface in a computer system, right? It's where software meets hardware. It's where the rubber hits the road. It's how you make the bits twiddle, all, any, any analogy you want to use. Okay, so that's cool. We agree, we all agree it's the most important interface in a computer system. Our industry has done a tremendous job at creating open standards to allow innovation, um, uh, uh, ecosystem development for virtually every other interface in a computer system. Why not at the ISA? There's been attempts, but they haven't really, either it was the right, wrong time in the industry, there wasn't enough critical mass around the idea, 32-bit um, vision as opposed to having something that could scale, so kind of shooting behind the duck, so to speak. So there really hasn't been a, an open standard ISA uh, that's been uh, successful in this space. I'll take you through a just, this is not really the NVIDIA example, but if we were all recruited by Madhu to develop a new SOC, like this NVIDIA Tegra chip, that's got you know, radio and audio DSPs on it, it's got an application processor on it, it's got some power management controllers and security controllers and so on. And if we came back to Madhu and we said, guess what, we got a surprise. There's dozens and dozens of cores on this SOC. They're all different ISAs. They all have a different tool chain. They all have a different stack, whoops, sorry. They all have a different stack and we'll need armies of engineers to support all the different um, tool chains and drivers that are associated with each of these cores. What do you think, right, we get fired. Uh, but obviously, our industry grew through integration of discrete implementations. SOCs didn't grow from a clean slate uh, like I'm describing. So that's not really a possible uh, scenario in terms of how the SOC model grew in the semiconductor space. And there wasn't really anything out there either that from a, from a function standpoint could scale to meet those different performance points that you'd have for all of these different cores. So do we really need all these different ISAs and do they need to be proprietary? And what if, oh, just what if there was one free and open ISA that had the scalability capability as well as the freedom of use to be used for everything? Well, obviously we think that's what RISC-V is all about. So what's really different about it? Well, it's, it's very simple relative to everything else that's out there, commercial implementations that are out there. And arguably, you know, with 30 years of hindsight, you would hope that we, you know, collectively the industry would be able to come up with something that is informed by what has worked really well and what hasn't worked so well in terms of computer architecture design. So a, a simple design uh, should be expected. And it's a clean slate design. Uh, there's a lot of work that's gone into a lot of the history in computer architecture by the, Ber the original Berkeley team. And one of the things that's interesting about the, this particular uh, aspect of the ISA is that there's a clear distinction between um, uh, microarchitecture and technology dependent features. So no, there, there are no baked in assumptions in what your architecture will look like based on what's in the ISA. The ISA spec is the ISA spec. Your architecture decision is your architecture decision. And this next point being modular is one of the most important aspects of the ISA in that um, it's not one big contiguous spec with all of the instructions. You literally implement the extension you need for your application. 
and we'll talk about extensions here in a, in a moment. There's multiple standard extensions that give you the range and flexibility for the instructions that you need and only the instructions that you need to implement in your device. And building on that modularity is designed for extensibility and specialization. There is uh, reserved space and reserved opcode space for user-defined instructions. So you can roll your own secret sauce into, into your design and it will become part of the, uh, uh, a standard RISC-V device and that you're using that uh, user-defined space. And it will never be trampled on, right? There will be no collision with any future standard extension that gets released. The other part is, again, using these extend this extension methodology is it's stable. Once, a, once an extension is locked and loaded, voted on and ratified, uh, but within the technical committee of, of the foundation, it's frozen. It will never change. If you have a device that's based on that extension, that device will run that software forever. If there's new functionality that gets added through roadmap development of the ISA, it will go in a different extension and you can choose to support that different extension in a future revision of your device. Even if that's actually some errata that gets discovered at some point. The point is, once an extension is frozen, that's frozen forever. Okay. Um, I'll just describe these and I'll, I'll skip the green card uh, story. So the, the base spec uh, is uh, RV32i, the integer base specification, less than 50 uh, instructions uh, needed for the base, and then a whole range of standard extensions that are developed for a multiply, M for multiply divides, atomics for like re-modify rights and, and so on, load store uh, capability, a bunch of different uh, floating point, and then this G notation, which is a concatenation of IMAFD, considered to be a general purpose processor uh, that you would use uh, you know, in, in a, to boot a modern operating system. And um, these extensions are all in various state of development as part of the, uh, 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 and as part of the base spec and, and work in the foundation. So this part's the part I'll skip because uh, it's way more fun when it builds. But this is an illustration. I'll get, just get to the green card. For those of you that are old and have gray hair like me, uh, you, you might remember working on PDP-8s or PDP-11s or different IBM mainframes. Those are old DEC digital machines or IBM mainframes, and you could literally, uh, you know, you would boot the thing with bootstrap switches and so on, and you'd have your either punch cards or what have you, to, uh, or tape to load up your assembly uh, program, and you literally had a cardboard uh, sheet of paper, or a sheet of cardboard to, that and often ended up being green for whatever reason, I'm not sure why, um, that you could fold up, put in your back pocket, and had all these assembly instructions for the, for the machine, and so, this is an illustration of the simplicity of the ISA. We actually have a RISC-V green card, and this is all in the instructions. So it's, it's, it's way more fun when it builds. But, and uh, this part's cool, right? So all the Patterson and Hennessy textbooks that you may have used in, in your graduate and undergraduate programs have all been converted over to RISC-V. So uh, we're, we don't have an official count. We're working on trying to get a better interaction with, with this and the, with a university outreach program. Uh, but our estimates are more than 200 uh, engineering programs and universities around the world are now using RISC-V based uh, teaching materials as part of their curriculum. So that's uh, a pretty interesting army of RISC-V literate engineers that will continue to graduate year after year. Generally speaking, if you did your master's work on computer architecture your, uh, details. You probably did, rolled your own custom ISA to prove some of the research theories that you were working on, and the last time you would have seen that would have been when you defended your, your thesis uh, for graduation. Now you can do that same research work with an open architecture like RISC-V, and then immediately graduate into, uh, uh, into industry uh, with some relevant, uh, some relevant knowledge. The, the textbook in the middle is actually, if you haven't uh, downloaded it, you can get it as an e-copy as well as a, uh, it's a companion book, right? It's kind of like the, the green card expanded out to about 100 pages. It explains the rationale for each of the instructions, the format, and so on. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty useful tool, the RISC-V reader. And the, uh, the motivation for Mona Lisa on the cover is because Leonardo da Vinci believed in things that were elegant um, and simple. 
Okay, uh, foundation overview. I'm going to go very quick. I think most of you know, incorporated in uh, 2015, August of 2015. We figured if, boy, a year and a half later, we could have 25 companies that would be interested in, in doing this, this work with us, we'd be thrilled. Uh, you'll see in a moment, we have way more than that. Uh, and the, the, the role of the foundation, as I said earlier, people call and ask, hey, I, where's my RISC V core? Or, I, don't, I don't like that Rocket does this. Well, then go talk to the Rocket guys. Uh, or I don't like that the ETH Zurich stuff does this, or that the Schottky stuff does this, right? The, the foundation, we love, we love everybody that implements a core, that's fantastic. We, we support and promote the existence of open source cores, proprietary cores, whatever you want. But the foundation is strictly focused on making sure that we have a free and open ISA available for everyone to use uh, in all devices. Um, and as part of that, we have a compliance uh, effort to make sure that my RISC-V device, when I say it's a RISC-V IMAFD compliant device, everyone knows what that means so that we can build an ecosystem around that. And part of the way we try to uh, um, control or regulate that is through licensing the, the trademark. Right? So there are, there are no licenses for the ISA. There's a license for the trademark, and all, of that, all that's required there is membership in the foundation to have that license if your device is for commercial benefit. If your implementations are free and open, uh, source implementations, you do not, you, you're granted a license, you do not need to be a member to, to get that license. So there's more behind that, happy to talk about that with anybody uh, who'd like. This is a, a bit of an eye chart. Uh, every time I put it up, it's out of date because literally I, we just signed another member agreement last night. Um, so we have more than 100 member companies uh, in the foundation now, closer to 125, I think is the number. And over 150 members, actually we're, I think it's more like 174 now when you combine the corporate and uh, institutional members with uh, individual members. This gives you an idea of the growth that we've had over the course of, of, uh, of the foundation's existence since back, back in August of 2015. This is way more fun when it uh, builds as well because this is, uh, we have a nice little animation, all the RISC-V logos pop up all over the world. We're now in more than 27 countries representing 57% of the world's population. And I'm not suggesting for a second that everybody, that 57% has a RISC-V device, base device in their pocket yet. Uh, but eventually that'll be the case. There's a board of directors that governs the foundation that really work for you guys, uh, for, for members. Um, to, to make sure that we live by the rules that we've published, right? So the bylaws and membership rules that are published is really what the, the board of directors governs. And the creation of various committees. Um, we have a technical committee chaired by Yunsip Lee at Sci-5, a security standing committee chaired by Helena Hanschuk at uh, Rambus, and then a marketing committee uh, chaired by Ted Marina at Microsemi. And underneath those committees, there's a variety of task groups focused on um, either evolution of, uh, of the spec, uh, marketing, marketing work, uh, running conferences, helping, helping things like, to do workshops like this, and so on. And in order to participate in these committees and task groups, you need to be a member of the foundation. Um, because that simply means that you've agreed to play by the same rules that everybody else has agreed to play by. Here's a list of the board. Um, we're, 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 th we're thrilled with uh, having Kirsta as our chair and Dave Patterson, who's now retired and uh, as an architect at Google, as our vice chair. And then Zvonimir Banditch from Western Digital, Charlie Hawk from Blue Spec, Rob Oshana from NXP, Franz Sisterman from NVIDIA, and Ted Spears from, from Microsemi. So with that, I'm going to stop here. The slide's in here for you to look at the, uh, the Western Digital and NVIDIA examples. Uh, I can spend a time at break and lunch talking through any of them if, you, if you'd like. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Uh, can you talk about the compliance test which you have? Sure. So the, the, the question was, could I talk about the compliance suite? So uh, thanks for the question because people kind of confuse around what that is. This is to make sure that your device runs the instructions that are in the extension that you say you've implemented, which sounds simple enough, 
but then starts to get into all kinds of different complexities around platform and performance. So it's not a performance test. It's not gonna compare your core against somebody else's core. Um, and, and the definition of how we're gonna implement those tests and how we're gonna run them is actually an, a very active discussion right now in the task group. So there's not a compliance suite that I can hand you. There's a bunch of uh, compliance you know, uh, and, and verification work that individual members have done that they'd probably share with you and that are all being considered as part of creating this open, it's a, this, this compliance suite which will be open source and available to anyone. Um, but it's first and foremost meant to be able to make sure that when you say you have a, you know, like I said, an IMAFD compliant device and I say the same thing, that they run the exact same instructions with the same behavior. That's, that's the intent. And it's to protect the sanctity of a single RISC-V standard in the marketplace. <laughs>